I'm Karen Donfrey, President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here today. I am especially happy to welcome Elmar Brock here today. Elmar, thank you so much for being here. I'm delighted also that we're co-hosting this event with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the European Parliament Liaison Office. Elmar Brock is known to many of you in this room, and I don't think we've ever had a July event that has gotten as high a subscription as this one has, which speaks to how well-known and well-regarded Elmar Brock is in this city. As many of you know, he has been a member of the European Parliament since 1980 and truly has helped shape the European Union that we know today. He also remains influential in German politics, and he is a close ally of Chancellor Merkel. He is a committed transatlanticist, as his co-chairmanship of the Transatlantic Legislators Dialogue evidences. In his role today as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, he is directly involved in the key foreign policy issues of our time including the very difficult situation in Ukraine as a result of Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and Russia's ongoing aggression in Ukraine's east. He is on the forefront of thinking about the future of the European Union's strategic relationship with Russia. That is why we chose to ask him to focus on that topic today. To moderate the conversation, we are lucky to have Dr. Stephen Zabo, Executive Director of the Transatlantic Academy, based here at GMF. The Academy will turn its substantive focus to Russia this fall, and Steve recently published a book on Germany, Russia, and the rise of geoeconomics. Steve, we appreciate your moderating. <laughs> a little ad there. Thank you, Elmar. Today's event is on the record. We are also live streaming the discussion, so hello to our audience outside the room. If any of you would like to tweet, we encourage you to do so. And the hashtag is pound GMF Europe. With that, I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Lars Henschel, who is director of the Washington office of the Adenauer Foundation. Thank you very much, Karen. Well, I'm the director here of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation's office. That's a public policy organization from Germany. We have something like 90 offices globally promoting democracy and also here in Washington, transatlantic uh, dialogue. We are close to the Christian Democratic Union the party of Angela Merkel and also Elmar Brok. And we are very happy to welcome him here. And I also have the pleasure to welcome you all for this uh, discussion here today. Well, I believe that Elmar Brok uh, can contribute today also to a broader discussion we have here in Washington. And um, this is related to 25 years ago. 25 years ago when the wall came down in Berlin, and Germany was on the way to unification, and Europe was on the way to unification, we thought that the ideological battles are over. Now we know that this is not true. We are back to ideological competition. And this is also something um, Elmer Brock sees, and therefore I believe that um, he will be able to contribute to this broader discussion we have here in town. Well, Karen told you what Elmer Brock is known for. Well, I will tell you what Elmer Brock is not known for. Elmer Brock is not known for keeping his opinion uh, to him. So therefore, I believe that we will have a very lively and interesting discussion. Welcome you all again, and over to Steve Sable. Thank you very much. I don't have, I have a mic. Oh, okay. oh, Thank you both, uh, Karen and Lars. It's great to, a great pleasure to moderate this discussion. Uh, with Herr Brock, let me start. Could you uh, to ask your sense of w how we got here? What is behind uh, you think Putin's strategy? Some blame the EU and NATO for enlarging and pushing up against his borders. The realists would make that case. Others would make the case that it's internally driven by the nature of the regime, the ideological ideology of the regime. How do you? Why did we get where we are now? How do you see? How do you interpret what's pushing Putin's policies? 
I think this is uh, several reasons. One reason is that he has totally failed to modernize the Russian system and that he has not to look to other uh, policies in order to convince his people and in uh, order to explain why he has to still to be in power. The Russian economy uh, reform has totally failed. The Russian economy is in the same situation as it was in the 90s. Uh, different to China, which has developed a self-reliant economy in a way, despite all the problems China has. The Russian economic system is the same like in the 80s. No developing of modern industry, no SMEs, uh, not really a self-reliant economy, but relying still on export of especially oil and gas, but also other raw materials. That exactly the structure of the 80s. And uh, so if a country is in economic trouble, they have always, very often history has shown, to look to the outside world to get the nation behind. The second point is, I think, a situation in November 12, 2012, as he became a third prime president. As he saw the demonstrations on the streets of Moscow at that time, I think then he has finally <coughs> decided to follow another strategy. Because he has seen, because of his failure of modernizing and liberalizing the country, that he can go forward with him as a leader. And the third question came, in my opinion, in 2013, when after he stopped Yanukovych, you can debate it perhaps later, to sign Vilnius, the sudden demonstration on the Maidan. This was all to our surprise. I was at that time in December two times there. When you speak before 160, 180,000 people who call freedom, 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 or Europe, 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 and carrying 10,000 of European flags then you see that Putin looks in the face of his own people. A young generation which is looking for economic reform and the reform of the state for democracy and the rule of law. Is a young generation, if this generation would be successful, Ukraine would be successful, then for the Putin system is no <coughs> place anymore in Russia. It will give you one example or one figure. In 1990, the GNP of Poland and uh, Ukraine was more or less the same. The Polish now is four times so high as Ukraine. So democracy, rule of law, market economy, and Europe work. It's a successful combination, which has made a lot of transformation processes in the East. And if this system might work and have the chance to work in the Ukraine, there's no reason that the Ukraine is not so successful. They are very well-educated people. They have uh, very good, in certain ways, infrastructures. Mm -hmm. They have the best agricultural possibilities in Europe. And uh, if they would have the chance to live like Poland, uh, then it would make all the difference. And here, I think, then it comes to the nationalist thing. We will debate later. But I think mm -hmm. that is part of the reason, reasons why he follows this policy. This doesn't sound like very good news for the future of Ukraine and the future of Russian policy in Ukraine. What do you expect uh, for short term over the summer and, and in terms of uh, the, 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 uh, the Minsk deadline? And what, do you, I mean, do you, and what kind of reaction should we have to a possible aggression or further aggression by Russia in Ukraine? First of all, it was important that the 28 European nations um, prolonged the sanctions. So his way to try to uh, divide the European countries failed. Mm -hmm. That is done until the end of January, mostly. But that is exactly the timeline at which Minsk has to implement it or not. So it's very clear the European Union will not lift the sanctions so long Minsk is not implemented. And uh, on that basis, there was last week on the Normandy format a discussion between uh, Putin, Poroshenko, Merkel, and Hollande, and they agreed on a certain timetable until the end of the year. Whether it has a credibility, that has to be seen. Uh, we do not know. Uh, but we have to see that despite the ongoing fightings, 
the frontiers of that region have not very much changed in the last three, four months. So the containment in a certain way had worked. And this is progress. And we have to use this to put much more help and aid into Ukraine that they can do the transformation process. Because this is the difficulty for that country, what Putin is looking for. He does not want to have the whole of Ukraine. He cannot look after that. And we talk to Russians, why do you not take the East Ukraine? They say, no, 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 we cannot finance it. They would like to have influence there. That they do with their own troops and soldiers. It's a hybrid war with their personal direct in, uh, in, uh, involvement. And at the same time, uh, they stop the Ukrainian government to do that, what I would say, the Polish example. And so this government is like in a sandwich situation. All the, transform, uh, the, 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 the reformers are dissatisfied while the reforms do not come fast enough. In October, there will be local elections, which will be quite decisive. On the other side, you have born your own country with all that nationalist attitude, which comes in certain corners of society, inevitable, if you are in such a situation. And how can we now help them to be in their reform program despite this war more successful? How can we send people there to build on them local government to help them? Uh, how we can be helpful in the constitutional process? I think it's a good sign that now the Verhoeven Arada, the parliament, has agreed on constitutional changes for the decentralization of the country, which is an important step forward that the Russian cannot say Ukraine does not fulfill the Minsk agreement. And, uh, and this is done together with the Venice Commission and the Council of Europe, uh, where it's the help to do that in a right legal way. And uh, I think they try to build it a little bit on the Polish proposal again, with this uh, different Wojwodschafs uh, uh, they have in, in Poland. The regionalization is pretty much similar to that what the Poland, uh, Poland uh, has done. And if the separatists now would agree to have local elections the same day in October, mm -hmm. that might be an alibi for President Poroshenko then to start direct negotiations with them, because they can say they have a mandate to discuss it. This is for him very much important to find the possibility of an interim agreement for that regions, which is put in that constitutional reform that by law a certain interim agreements can be done for such a region to come to a compromise. So this is, was done in the last week, and I think it's a proper progress that it could be achieved. Well, the financial needs of Ukraine are enormous. Uh, you've just gone through this painful discussion on Greece and another major commitment to Greece. Where is the money going to come from? The Europeans are certainly not going to be, I think, in a mood to, to do major financial aid. The U.S. is not going to be doing it. Where do you see the kind of financial support Ukraine needs coming from? Look, there is a plan which the European Union has decided last year for uh, giving money for free, give credits and guarantees, about 13 billion euros. And uh, the Euro International Monetary Fund has given a similar amount of money, about 17 billion euros. Uh, and uh, I think that's an important point, and this has to be proper used. That's a condition, again, that the system has to be changed to fight corruption if you send such money in. And you have to kill corruption. That means the key point is to change the legal system, the role of a, a general prosecutor and all that, and that you have independent local courts. That is, again, in all these transformation systems, you have to learn that you cannot reform a country if there is no uh, working, good working, local administration and local court system, which is more important than central government in every of these countries of transformation system. And here we often look so on a way to go forward. And this is, I think, not so bad. And, uh, uh, and we have to give all more money. This is the fight of systems. Putin wants to destroy by, by annexation and occupation mm -hmm. the ability of a country to make individual decisions about the future of such a country. That's the aim. And not there, it's also in Transnistria, it's in Abkhazia and South of Asia, it's the Canonic Karabakh question, it's Armenia and Azerbaijan, it's always the same method. Well, the main idea, the method is sometimes a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
we have to see that and make it impossible that this has such an impact on a country uh, that uh, such a country cannot move forward to have the proper uh, reform process. Mm -hmm. There's a question to discuss about Armenia, which in, in which way Armenia was stopped to sign the association agreement with the European Union. Mm -hmm. The president was asked to come uh, to Moscow, and then was told, if you follow that and do not become a member of the Eurasian Union, uh, then you will not get weapons from us, and the Azeris with will have then all the possibilities and they were put. I could remember that a German Chancellor did use that method of 38. <laughs> yes. uh, speaking of Germans, uh, the Germans have been the key player and, and Angela Merkel has been the key player on Russia over the last couple of years. Can you tell us a bit about how you see the discussion now in Germany on Russia? How much has the view on Russia and strategy on Russia changed? How deep does it go beyond Merkel, these changes that we've seen? Because I think you're absolutely right, the whole solidarity, which has surprised Putin, I think surprised a lot of us too, largely due to Merkel and I think into Germany's role. So how do you see, is there a real change occurring now in Germany in terms of thinking about Russia? There's very often an emotional feeling with many Germans which is positive for Russia. That is historical reasons. And it has reasons also that a war between Russia and Germany was, had never a good result for Germany. And therefore, mm. do everything not to have war with Russia. That's an understandable feeling. Then there's a second feeling that they say, we Germans have done so much harm to the Russian people in the Second World War that we have to take that into account. And it was difficult to explain that perhaps the Ukraine has got more problems from the Germans in the Second World War. The main battles were where Russia and Ukraine nowadays. And if what German troops did in Ukraine to the villages and the people there was at least so harmful as it went to Russia. So they have the understanding that you cannot support Russia because of uh, the Russians' uh, uh, terrible situation in the Second World War, but that is also to all the other uh, regions. See, my hometown, my home village, is uh, Russian, no, that was wrong, a Soviet uh, prisoners of war camp, where 65,000 Soviet soldiers died. 65,000. And uh, the president of our Republic, Gauk, was there on the 8th of May, and he made it clear that were Soviet soldiers, not Russian. There were Ukrainians, Belarusians, people from Kazakhstan, who is other barred, so far they were barred. And he made it very good thing. He invited all the ambassadors of such country, independent countries, and placed the Ukrainian ambassador next to the Russian as a message. And uh, this to overcome to understand in Germany is very much important. The third point I think that we agree all in the United States is it would be for the whole West better to have a good relationship to Russia. It's all the terrible materials, security reasons, if I see other upcoming powers in the world. It's better to have a good relationship with Russia than bad relationship with Russia, both in the Russian and in the European context and an American context, and even for Russia more. If I see that only eight million ethnic uh, uh, Russians still live in Siberia, and I see the many Chinese moving to the north, if I see they have not made a deal on gas, where they have financed the pipeline and have given, uh, no, sold the gas to the Russians under production costs, uh, then they see also no good future for Russia. They can become a junior partner of China. So there's a lot of interest on both sides to come to terms to each other that we have to try, and then it's the last point, but not under the violation of international law. We have the Helsinki Agreement, and we have Budapest Memorandum also signed by the United States. It says at that time, for 94, Ukraine was the third biggest nuclear power in the world. They have given up their nuclear weapons under the guarantee of the Great Britain, United States and Russia for their territory integrity and the sovereign rights to make their own decisions where to go. 
And one of the guarantee countries has abolished that. It was the same main uh, legal points of the Helsinki Agreement, also the Charter of Paris of 90, and so on. And uh, at the end of the day, also of the NATO-Russia uh, agreement from 97. And here we have to make sure clear that if this system is destroyed, that there's no reason anymore in Europe to wage war. And if we accept the Putin argumentation, we have that certain historical rights, or I have to protect my minorities, but it's not true. There's not one case in the Council of Europe, not a quarter of the Council of Europe, that it was a discrimination of Russian minorities. Yes. And uh, thirdly, my security interests are not met. If you accept such three points, you can wage war in 100 places in Europe immediately. So, and that was, is our policy for the 21st century, that that cannot count anymore. That is not a question of near abroad. Every country, especially the smaller countries, must have a right to make their own decisions, which agreement they do, they have made a trade agreement with Europe. Is that, could that an argument that a country makes a trade agreement that a third partner invades that country? If we accept that, where is then this policy will finish? Well, do we continue to respect the agreements we made with the Soviets at the end of the Cold War about not deploying permanently into Eastern Europe and so forth because of what they have now done in terms of breaking the Budapest Memorandum and breaking a lot of the agreements we've had with them? Does this change the whole nature now of our understanding of the European security environment? Yeah. Although well, first of all, we have to stick that these agreements are uh, accepted and the Minsky Agreement is going that step by step again, coming to force also in that place. Uh, the second point is, because Ukraine is no NATO country, because of other reasons, we do not wage war before because of Ukraine. And Russia is still a nuclear power. It was the same decision the United States did in Budapest 56 or on other occasions. And uh, then we have only one weapon, that are sanctions. Sanction is our peaceful mean to tell the aggressor that aggression is expensive. Simple as that. And so long they don't agree, we do that. And the, German, uh, the, uh, the president of the German uh, Federation of Industry has said, we do not like sanctions, but international law is more important than business interest. I cannot say it better as this sentence is said in that. Uh, but it leads to a no situation. We have now NATO countries, which have certain ex historic experiences, the Baltic States, for example, and uh, Poland is, no, it was gone, my colleague from Romania. There are NATO countries now. How can we create a credibility, as we did it until 89, that an aggression on NATO territory is aggression of all our countries? The Poles remind us on the West Berlin situation. West Berlin uh, was free because there were American, French, and English soldiers. The Russians did not know when they made an attack on that. They would have won that in two days because of size. Take that, how the American government will react to that. The Poles say now, why do we not have German American soldiers in Poland or in Latvia? Why to not? tell the same message mm. to them. But that means the breach of, from our side, of the NATO Russia agreement of 97. Therefore, they had now made this rotation system in the last NATO summit uh, that is just a step before. But if you have asked in your first question that we made all the mistakes in order to force Russia to the situation, we kept it. It was the deal, a time of European and German unification, no NATO troops west of Elbe, permanent NATO troops west of Elbe. And the NATO has kept that until now. There are no permanent NATO troops there. And that is more or less this uh, statement of the, of the NATO countries that NATO-Russia agreement, the one-sided statement we made with her. We kept that until now. And uh, therefore, it's just not true what they tell about NATO aggression coming to the frontiers. 
But when I talked to the Latvian defense minister, he asked me, will you come? Or is it not better to be there? We, how can we, for example, that I think the decision and the definition NATO has to do, when comes Article 5 of NATO and hybrid war? Uh, in the Ukraine, it's Russian troops and Russian material. And we know from pictures now, the OC Secretary General just showed me it the other day, we see them now on the train, they'll bring in uh, tanks and so on. So it's a proof for that also. What happens when we come to Estonia? It's a small village, which Russian minor majority, they take over the town hall and declare independence. Mm -hmm. uh, is that with Russian military protection, is that Article 5? If that is not defined as Article 5, they could, can do the same thing as they did with Eastern Ukraine. That is a question of credibility of NATO and of European Union. And here we are coming to the terms which are with, our, with ourselves mm -hmm. that we would mean to say it in that clear way also major discussions in our capitals because the risk which are uh, connected to that, but that is our situation. And, uh, but we have to believe that, first of all, we have a renaissance of NATO. NATO was, in the mind of the people, not really existing. We know now, again, for collective uh, defense of Europe, is NATO needed, and that means America. There's no collective defense of Europe possible without America. And therefore, this proposal, the Russians say, we did not follow the proposal to have a joint security strategy for Europe. Mm -hmm. Our condition is to do that with the Russians if America is considered as a European country. Without America, not such a deal with Russia. Because this is needed, and we have seen it now again, for our collective defense. And therefore, this relationship with the United States of America is so much important. And we have this renaissance again in a certain limit. Okay. Thank you. I think I'll open it up now. We have lots of people and lots of questions, I'm sure. So please just raise your hand, and when you're calling, just to identify yourself, if you would. We'll bring the microphone over uh, back in the corner. Is there, is there a microphone? Yeah, back of it. Thank you. I thought your comments were very clear. I I'm Garth Trinkle, independent here in Washington. Could you talk about how, within the European Parliament, people are talking about the transformation of hybrid warfare going forward. There's been some talk recently that Putin now, having been contained to approximately one third of the two eastern oblasts, the two eastern provinces of, of Ukraine, will turn to a stepped up disinformation, low scale terrorism, and political destabilization uh, they perhaps a year ago would have tried that in Kharkiv and Odessa first. Could you talk a little bit ab ab about the Hungarian Transcarpathian re region um, as, as, as well as southwestern Ukraine, which has large sympathies for, for Russia and Transdenistria? Thank you. Odessa it will not possibly anymore. They have no strong new uh, <laughs> uh, governor. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, I had these thoughts, let's say, three, four months ago, too. I'm not so sure anymore that that will be a strategy. And I think that it's very clear. If they continue the aggression one or the other way, they will get more sanctions. And we got in the European Parliament, in the Landsbergis report about relations to Russia, a clear decision on that. We stick to the sanctions until Minsk, and if there is an increase of Russian aggression, we talk about further sanctions. And to my surprise, it was here a broad majority in the European Parliament across the aisles. And uh, therefore, I think that uh, it's very clear. The question is, that is our problem. And then the wrong message is energy policy. We have not a real energy uh, union until now. And this is again a question with the system, the same when we debate with, 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 with China. There is everything, foreign security policy, economic policy, investments in one hand, 
because it's done by state companies or state uh, led companies companies we have a free market economy is private enterprises in the energy sector how can we have a joint energy strategy in the same way to answer that it was a big mistake now by German companies that said also public as South Stream was stopped Nabucco was stopped with all that now we have the doubling of the Nord Stream through the Baltics with the support of a German a, a Dutch and a British company 51% Gazprom. This is a shortcoming of democratic free societies. How can you can control that in the system legally? And here we have to see that this is a real problem and therefore uh, our debate uh, to have uh, at the commission has proposed uh, to come to the energy union which has much more possibilities that we can have a policy on one hand in this question would be very much important to send the right message to Mr. Putin. Thank you. Jeff Goldstein from the Open Society Foundations. Mr. Brock, um, should the elections in Luhansk and Donetsk in October not be seen as having been free and fair and therefore failing to convey legitimacy on whoever winds up winning, how will it be possible to move forward with implementation of Minsk? Look, uh, whether that practically is a free and fair election is possible, if I see that would mean that the, all the migrants from refugees from that region should have the right to vote, and how that can be organized. So that there will be fully free elections, I do not believe. But in a certain way to find a contact to negotiate the modus vivendi, it might be used. And uh, this is, I think, the important question. If decentralized Ukraine under the basis of the decision of the Kiev parliament is agreed on with certain exemptions, then it would be, I think, a major progress. I do not know whether that will work, but they're ready to talk uh, on that level, and uh, this would give another way of legitimation in that question. I do not really know how that will go forward, but this is the situation that people look in, and that it, as a symbol is seen, the work in the moment on that, that the election would be on the same day in Ukraine, on the same law in the Ukraine. And uh, therefore, the Ukrainians, uh, the Kiev government has not changed, despite it would be needed, the electoral law for local elections, for these elections in order not to give them an alibi because of that, not to follow that electoral law. So let's see how in the next eight weeks this debate will go on. Yes, sir. Thomas Beermann, IFC World Bank. Yeah, here we go. IFC World Bank, I have one question regarding the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, the Asian Infra Investment Bank is live April 15 was admission deadline. The Russians applied late and were admitted two days before the deadline after Iran, after Germany, after Israel, after South Korea. Uh, it was a humiliation by China essentially to keep them hanging so long. What do you think will happen with this Asian Infra Bank? What do you think will happen with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that completely overlaps with the Asian Infrastructure Bank? And what is the role of Russia that is now uh, treated essentially as a late guest third largest shareholder, Germany, largest non-Asian shareholder. What is their role? How much more decline essentially is coming? How much more does China show them who rules? I think that at the end of the day, the BRICS countries try to change the old system, the bread and wood systems in a certain way. But I must say this is also the weakness of Europe and others. I know that perhaps the conversation with Merkel Obama was a little bit late on that subject to have an important interest after the Brits had made the decision to join. We were all surprised that the Brits joined that bank. And therefore, we in the European Parliament work at the moment on a report, I myself a rapporteur on that, what can be done with the Treaty of Lisbon, that we have to come in the European Union, that uh, we have to come to a common representation of the European Union in international financial institutions. That means IMF, World Bank, but also how to do policy towards such countries. Otherwise, it has shown again, this time it was the Brits, sometimes others, someone runs because he believes he has a certain advantage because of that. 
and the winners are always the others. And here I think uh, it shows again that European countries need here a stronger, better cooperation to deal properly with that. Yes, Jerry, over here from there. Over here, please. And then we'll go there and then there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jerry Hyman at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I was wondering if you could take a little bit of a longer look when you, the, you answered the, what was the motivation for Putin in the case of Ukraine and the first issue you raised was the economic decline and his failure of economic policy. Assuming that that continues and assuming the demographic trends continue, what do you see as the long-term relationship between Europe and Russia? What do you see as its policy toward, Russia's policy toward its Western neighbors and vice versa? Look, it was, I have not in detail said it all, this is deep economic crisis of Russia where the sanctions are on, put on top of that. Really, it's the internal sanctions. It's a question of the political transformation process, the economic political transformation process, which I mentioned as the Polish example. And then it's this question of emotional feeling. Putin has said a few years ago, the great the greatest disaster of the 20th century was the destruction of the Soviet Union. And uh, this is his belief to get all countries again back. If you listen to his speech, which he delivered in the Duma on the day of the formal annexation of uh, Crimea, I was reminded on other similar speeches somewhere else. And uh, this is his feeling bring back your holy soil to your country. It's combined with certain religious feelings, the role of the Orthodox Church, which is uh, very, it's not just clear strategic policies. It's, it's much more emotional, historical myth in it, and this uh, combination you have. Uh, and uh, the talk about Novorossiya, Novorossiya means great part of, the, of, of Ukraine, uh, not all part. But he talked at the same time about, in, in December I think it was, about the advantages of the Hitler-Stalin pact. And the Hitler-Stalin pact, the best Arabia, which is now Moldova, given to the Soviet Union. It was given the West Ukraine to Soviet Union, which was at that time Polish and before Austria. And it gave the independent Baltic states to Soviet Union. The Hitler-Stalin pact was the borderline of the Soviet Union to the West until 1990, 1991. Exactly that line agreed. Not many people know it anymore. And this type of educated people in the KGB, historians in Russia, dream about that, to create the great power again, the empire. And uh, this, I think, is also part of the motivation. And uh, this is the question why we have to be afraid because of that. And uh, because economic argumentations we need, uh, we have with Russia, the common interests, what we have, uh, if you see the uh, demographic development, uh, the uh, average life perspective of a Russian man is 59 because of high spirit reasons. Except for Putin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you see this development, every ratio must tell you that this is the wrong policy. But sometimes you have leaders who have not the, the ratio of their politics. It's the experience of history. And I must say, that makes me nervous. Who is controlling this plan? In the old Soviet Union, there was still a Politburo. The Secretary General, General Secretary of a party needed the support of this group of old men who were not very risky. This control is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, there's a modern Putin who understands what a modern world does, 
or how much is he in a certain environment where you can reach him, where you cannot reach him anymore with racial arguments. Nobody of us knows that, how far that goes. And this, I think, is one of the insecurities we have to feel. Absolutely. And, uh, I can give, do, cannot give you an answer to that. Absolutely. Uh, Jerry, over here, please. Thanks, Steve. I'm Jerry Livingston from the German Historical Institute. Of course, Russia has been expansive, joyfully expansive, ever since that great German Tsarina, Catherine the Great. So their present phase is not unusual. I have three... Make Germany responsible for Katarina the Great. <laughs> What's that? Do not make Germany responsible for Katarina the Great. Well, I don't know. Dessau was responsible for something. That's where she was born, I think. I have three quick questions that are military related. First of all, number one, uh, Germany is a rare European country in having a budgetary surplus. So why can't it spend its 2% on, of gross domestic product on defense? Secondly, why can't Germany participate in more military exercises in Eastern Europe? Uh, good, I understand the reasons for not being able to station troops there. Um, but there was a military exercise in Moldova just concluded a few days ago. Germany was not present. And lastly, why can't Germany upgrade uh, some of the Bundeswehr equipment, which I gather is outdated and decrepit in many ways? First of all, Germany takes part in that. We do all the air control for the Baltic countries, the German Air Force. We have a, a joint military uh, organization with the Danes and the Poles with headquarters in Stettin. And uh, the Germany takes part in many, many European military events from Africa, in the Horn of Africa, in a certain way, a mix of civilian and military ones in the Western Balkans. The Germans are, I think, involved at the moment in six or seven of these uh, international events. And uh, we give so much money as every done in Europe does. Great Britain has said no, in the election campaign, a Tory government has said we will go under 2%. It was an election campaign message. Germany has increased this year, despite that development in the European countries, uh, our budget. And, uh, but it does not help us all. This 2% will become that, what is the minimum goals in development policy. 0.7. It's in every paper, but nobody believes it. That's the reality. We have to come in Europe to much closer cooperation where we try to do something. This pooling and sharing policy. But put it on the European level and Brussels more together. To explain also sometimes to our American friends and partner of American friends in Europe that this is not against NATO but strengthening NATO. Look, the European Union member countries spent 192 billion euros per year for defense. That it's around 45% of what the United States of America spends. But only with 10 or 15% of results, because everyone produces his own ammunition still. I overdo it now a little bit. But to make common procurement, research and procurement, can create so many synergy effects that with the same amount of money, we could become much better. We have spent more than double so much money than the Russians and have more soldiers than the United States of America, but with nearly zero operational result. That is our organization in Europe. We have to Europeanize it. And this, I think, is the important question. We have armies in Europe where the overhead costs are 80%. You have all the civil servants, but no soldiers anymore at the end of the day. Even the German army has overhead costs of 48%. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Therefore, we work on that Europeanizing it. The European summit, not much enough, but in a certain way, get progress. We have done on this basis of these figures now reporting my committee, which will send to the plenary soon. European army? The European army will be at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, for European army, you have to change the European treaties and the constitutions. I'm against the European army, which has not on a European level parliamentary control. And the European Parliament has not the right to control that, cannot make a decision on war and peace. 
This is still with the member states. Therefore, we have to build all the structures, mm -hmm. and we generally debate how our parliamentary veto possibility is not weakening cooperation in the European <coughs> Union and NATO on that. There's certain progress, but not enough. Uh, but to see, take that into consideration to go forward, and uh, at the end of the day, it will be European army as in Germany, both parties, government parties, have agreed to that, and it's in a coalition pro program of this government to come to the end of the European army. Uh, but the legal conditions are not there. I think that needs more years. But make the practical sense. Have common procurement, common research on that, pooling and sharing. Not every army should must do everything. They have a division of labor, uh, and uh, for example, but this is great progress. I come from Westphalia in Münster, the place where the Westphalian peace was done. It's the third Europe, uh, German army corps, together with 80% of the Dutch army. Every two years, the general, the commander changes. Two years a Dutch one, two years a German one. If you have someone would have told me 20 years ago, that would be possible, because of historical reasons. So we are moving, not fast enough in my opinion, but we are moving. And here I think the United States should more, put more pressure on us, not say, that a European caucus in NATO is a disaster for NATO. No, only a strong Europe, military strong Europe, strengthens NATO. This is a different world now. I had somebody in the back, I think, who was, was it over uh, Go ahead, yes, over here, and then behind. Yes, right there, thank you. And then we'll come over yeah. to you. <coughs> Chris Bladowski from Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation. Uh, you have mentioned that the United States forms part of Europe. And if this is the case, how do you explain the then Secretary of the Treasury, Timothy Gartner, being practically chased out of town when he was in Europe by not one, but two European finance ministers when he tried to discuss the um, common ways of uh, fighting the financial crisis? And if the United States is part of Europe, how do you explain the fact that so many Europeans are up in arms against TTIP, which effectively would bind the two continents together. Thank you. Look, to solve our financial problem is our own job. I talked about security defense policy. And uh, if you have every year your problem that you have to close your state because on the budget matters you do not find an agreement on Congress, you do not also invite Brussels to solve your problem here. Similar case. You have in the United States now a, a per head, per capita, uh, a sovereign debt which is higher than of Greece, to give you figures. And uh, that, uh, I think, is another debate if we come to this financial sector. Uh, but in the, in the military field, I believe, yes, we should do that. And uh, if the TTIP question, look, I live in the St. Regis. Next is AFO CIO. I saw just this morning a big uh, poster there. Don't destroy lives. Be against TPP. So you have your debate in your country. We have a debate in our countries. What is wrong with that? But we had a decision in the European Parliament two weeks ago, where it was a two-third majority, more than a two-third majority for TTIP. That's a good result. Do you get a two-third majority in the Senate for such agreements? We'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll have a question over here, please. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back. Mm -hmm. hey. Hello, Carl Alto with the Joint Baltic American National Committee. We represent the Estonian, <coughs> Latvian, and Lithuanian American communities. Just to go back to your comments about the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, this Thursday will be the 75th anniversary of the Wells Declaration. Uh, Sumner Wells was the acting Secretary of State who in um, uh, June 1940 set the U.S. policy of not recognizing the Soviet takeover of the Baltic countries. Um, and, and with that in mind and other uh, current um, takeovers uh, and, and the transgressions of Russia by Russia in, in South Ossetia, for instance, how, how is the European Parliament uh, addressing uh, those areas? And also maybe a word about the uh, media, the pushback against the, the Russian info war Maybe you also want to add Crimea to that list. Will you take yeah. the same position on Crimea? I think it's a very uh, clear uh, position in NATO and European Union in the Western world not to recognize any of such states or annexations. 
we will do when we said in that way, behave towards Crimea as the United States did rightly towards the Baltic States. It was a good example we should follow. And uh, this is until relatively successful. If I see, for example, how many states have recognized South as Asia and Abkhazia, it's a few islands somewhere. Uh, and uh, even not Brother Russia has done that, if I have it right in my head. And uh, therefore, I think uh, we have to find sometimes a modus vivendi, but it does not mean recognize it. And I have uh, told it uh, my friends in Ukraine several times. Uh, we never recognized the second German state, but we did business with them, had a relationship, modus vivendi, until the time was ripe. And uh, the uh, Ukrainians are intelligent, in a way. They, for example, the Crimea relies to nearly 100% on electricity and the water from the mainland. This was not disrupted until now. It's wise. It's a way to find a modus vivendi. Then we come back to the system fight again. If we become better, freedom, democracy, more wealth and social security, as we did it in the Cold War, and show that to the people. If the people have a choice, as they had a choice in East Germany, to live in that system or in that system, they made their choice. And very clearly, and it was a question of weeks and months to solve that problem. Be good in your own quarters. We should help the Georgians, the Ukrainians, to become successful in that part where they have the authority to govern and to show to the others what is the difference. That's our answers of free societies. And here we have to support such countries in that because that is the fight for the right democratic system in our own interest. To, that the free world wins in Ukraine by showing that we can do better than such a Russian command system is winning also for our countries. Thank you. We'll have time for one more, I think, then we'll have to bring. John, John Hudson with Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, upon completion of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran, uh, to what extent, if any, could Iran be seen as an attractive energy partner vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, given Moscow's uh, belligerence? Look, it's a question that nearly everywhere where we take our energy from are not uh, my political friends. But uh, between, when you have to get it from certain systems, then it's better to diversify it. And, uh, that in this case, Iran possibilities see it positively. Uh, but uh, that should not mean that we know now that after this agreement, Iran is a democratic, reliable country which will fight terrorism everywhere. We will have a lot of other problems with uh, uh, Tehran, as we have with Russia, and as we have it with other countries. Uh, but the, one of my main reasons for that is I was in the last quarter of a year in Iraq, in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and Tehran. When I look into that case of refugee camps, what's going on there, it's proxy wars. Where richness is used by Tehran and Riyadh, to make it short, it's more, more, busy, more complicated. If we overcome, if we come, if the United States and Europe would cooperate together and put the heads of the Iranians and the Saudis together to stop this proxy wars where millions of people are refugees and are killed. This whole situation in that region reminds me of the 30 World War in the 70th century, where because of Catholicism and Protestants, uh, the Swedish, the French, the Habsburgs waged war in Germany. At the end of that war, half of the German population was killed. Religious as an alibi to become a proved regional power on takeover. And if we have not solved that overall question, we will solve nothing in Syria and Iraq. Is it not a reason to have this common diplomatic effort of the Europeans and Americans? to do something like that. And if I see the Russian behavior 
in this context of the negotiation with Iran. I think in that question we might get support. That question. At least it's worthwhile to try. But this is in the last two, three years a totally different opinion. We have now this ISIS situation from Afghanistan to near Nigeria. More or less the same thing. Differentiations, many in that connections. And if I do not understand that we have to build totally new alliances, that these incredible systems which kill people in a way nobody can understand. But it's not for the first time in history that was done. And as a German know what we're talking about. But to take that is not, not a reason for that. And therefore, I know that there are certain risks in that. I know that, uh, but I think to have the, uh, the question to have in two months' time a bomb in Iran or have a possibility to stop that and take them into account in a certain way where they have their own interest. The sanctions have worked. It must be clear that sanctions come back if they, that is in the agreement, in, if they do not that job. This is a decisive moment. Uh, the Financial Times has written a few days ago, is that what Obama did, uh, perhaps similar to that what Nixon did with China? Nothing is historically comparable. But it might be the case. It is full of risks. But what is the alternative under the present circumstances? What is the alternative to that? Nobody in this town I talked to could tell me what is the alternative. And the European Union, all 28 foreign ministers agreed yesterday. I shared myself the meetings of the EPP foreign ministers yesterday morning. Not one was against it, but knowing the risks in that. United Nations has decided yes and no. We have two groups who are against this agreement, the opposition in Iran and the opposition in this country. <laughs> well, thank and, you. And I and, and, uh, hope yeah. that this important question will investigate it, whether it's a good deal or not a good deal. But please not make this deal to a question for or against Obama. <coughs> then we are on the wrong track. You know, I think that's a very good advice. The Secretary Kerry made that point already that this is not just about the United States. It's about a whole alliance, a whole alliance and how the Europeans is, feel about it as well. Well, thank you. We have more questions, but no more time. Uh, it was a really excellent discussion. I think on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you for your excellent insights and hope you come back to see us again very soon. Thank you. Very much.